Every farm has a story. When it comes to dairy farming, these stories are often only heard by the animals raised, the land stewarded, and the family that makes it all possible. Join me, Dairy Gal Val, as I interview individuals from across the dairy industry, both within the United States and across the globe, discussing topics like farm management, the food industry, ag business and technology, and most importantly, their farm story. This is the Dairy Hour Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Dairy Hour Podcast. I am your host, Dairy Gal Val. This episode today is brought to you by Zisk app. Zisk is a free app that helps you accurately predict your dairy's financial future. This tool allows you to enter your farm information into an easy to use app and uses multiple algorithms to help calculate profitability for the next 12 months on your dairy. Ziskapp.com or check them out on Instagram and Facebook. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm joined here today by Hannah Woodhouse from the lovely country of Canada. Hannah, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Uh, so what part of Canada are you from? I don't know if you want to give like a little introduction of yourself so everyone knows who you are. Yeah, so I'm from Canada, well, known as snow country. <laughs> we did get some snow this morning. Um, I'm from Ontario, though, so specifically southwestern Ontario. I grew up on a dairy farm that's just up on Georgian Bay. It's about two hours north of Toronto. Uh, but currently, I am at the University of Guelph, so I'm completing my PhD uh, in, in dairy science. And so specifically, I study a milk quality component called free fatty acids. And uh, as I said, completing my PhD, so excited to be done school and uh, transition into the industry. Definitely. Um, so you were saying earlier, how many years of schooling have you been through so far for this? Yeah, so um, I've just finished up my seventh year of post-secondary education. I did four years of my undergrad, which was in biomedical sciences and a minor in, in nutrition. I did a year of my master's in epidemiology, and then I'm on my uh, second, going into my third year of my PhD in epidemiology. And are you, that's a lot of years, are you almost done or like where yeah. do you have an end in sight? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm hoping to defend my thesis in April. So a couple awesome. more months. So the end is in sight for sure. It's kind of a grind time just doing a lot of uh, writing of my thesis right now and then hoping to defend it in, in April. That's insane. I don't know. I really liked college, but I don't think I could have been there for that yeah. many years. Well, I think I would honestly, have gone into pain. I'm very fortunate my project's been going quite uh, rapidly. Usually it's two years for a master's and four years for a PhD. So oh, that would have been 10 years in total. So I've, I've cut out a few years, which is, which is quite nice. So that's, yeah, definitely doesn't, uh, it doesn't hurt. I don't know how um, paying for college works for you guys, yeah. but um, it definitely probably cuts down on the student loans and whatnot. So I guess that's for a sure. for savings sure. in the bank, right? Yeah. I've been very fortunate to have uh, scholarships throughout that has paid for my education, which, as I said, I'm very fortunate for that. I'm very grateful for them. But for sure, you know, a lot of my colleagues, my friends have a lot of uh, student loans at, yeah. this, at this time of their life. Which is, it's unfortunate to be like, here, in order to get an education, here's a mountain of debt. Now uh, you get to work the rest of your life and pay us back for it. Like Exactly. It's definitely one of those things you really have to be passionate about to go on and do something like that or be very fortunate and work hard like you have to be able to get those scholarships that have really helped helped keep you out of that never ending yeah. hole of student <laughs> debt when you get out. That's that's great to hear then. Um, so you also you have very strong dairy roots, obviously, and you're in a very dairy career path what do you plan on doing with your all of your degrees and yeah so kind of rewinding a little bit um, actually going to University of Guelph is where I've been at Guelph for as I said seven years um, I had aspirations to actually go into the medical field and become a doctor when I first went to school I thought that was going to be my career plan my mom is a vet 
Um, my dad's a farmer. <laughs> They're a great pair, but I want to more follow my mom's footsteps and either go into veterinary medicine or human medicine. Um, I was very highly involved in athletics, still am, um, but that's kind of why I chose more the human medicine route side. And that changed uh, shortly after I went into university. I, I honestly miss my cows too much and missed agriculture. And so I've kind of done a full circle. Uh, now, as I said, back in agriculture, finishing up my PhD in that dairy field. I would love to transition into industry. Uh, milk quality is obviously my passion. That's what I'm working on. And I'd love to do some sort of quality control measures within either Dairy Farmers of Canada, Dairy Farmers of Ontario, or even going abroad as well. Um, I've taught a, a couple of classes at university and I do really enjoy teaching people. I really like sharing knowledge. Uh, but if I want to stay in university and be like a professor, I'd have to do a postdoc, which I've, I'm kind of ready to explore what other opportunities there are outside of academia. But I'm sure that one day I'll return to academia and eventually be at a post-secondary institution uh, and teach. But right now, honestly, there's a lot of options, which is great. Yeah. Like all the PhD in epidemiology, which uh, for those who don't know what that is, it's basically the study of diseases and looking at prevention. Um, and it can be applied to a lot of different disciplines. So I could go and work in public health, but obviously my my passion is in with the dairy industry. So that's where I'd like to go. Uh, so, yeah, kind of just keeping my options open, uh, but definitely dairy focused for sure. And uh, we'll see where where that leads. That's awesome. So definitely cows over people for you. I, um, <laughs> I tend to follow that route. I do. I like people and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm like, ah, the cows don't, they just, they're happy to be cows and they're not, exactly. they don't talk and that back. Being, and, yeah. And that yeah, being said, I do still love the interaction with producers. You know, I think oh, definitely. being part of the dairy farming community, I love, uh, yeah, talking with producers or people within the industry. And so that's why I wanted to go into industry and kind of get that uh, that balance between both seeing the cows and then talking to the farmers as well. Oh, definitely. And um, so do you have, um, you know, do you have like a dream job or are you just kind of going to put yourself out there and see where, where the wind takes you or? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, um, obviously my dream job is, is working with, with dairy cows in some shape or form. There's not really like, I'm not gonna have like a doctor in veterinary medicine where then you would be expected to be a veterinarian or, or a doctor in human medicine. So the nice thing about my degree, it's very, um, it can be applied to a lot of different things and there's a lot of options, which is nice, but at times it feels a little bit overwhelming because there's, there's too many options. So as I said, right now, I'm kind of just getting feels of, of what is out there. I think one of my dreams um, would be to work overseas for a little bit. I love to explore a different dairy industry um, across either in New Zealand or the Netherlands. I think that would be a really great opportunity. I love the University of Guelph. I love Ontario, but I have been here for my whole life. And I think it would be really nice to explore a different, a different place. Definitely good to spread your wings and see what's out there. Mm -hmm. So. Awesome. So do you want to talk a little bit about what your um, what you're getting your PhD in? You mentioned milk fatty acids. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I guess high level sure. because most of the uh, audience here is not scientists. So. Yes, I will try and bring it to a very basic level. So actually how my project started, um, I'll go back to when I was in undergrad, uh, I had a, I was very fortunate to get an academic scholarship uh, called the President's Scholarship. And that essentially gave me, it paid for my tuition, but it also gave me a summer research position. So I got to work under a professor and do research um, for, for a semester of the, of the summer. And so at that time, I was like, oh, I really miss my cows. I want to do research in, in dairy. Uh, so I went to a dairy professor at the university, and I basically told him, I was like, look, I'm, I'm free labor. Do you have a project for me? And he said, actually, I do. Um, there's coffee shops that are complaining that their milk won't froth. Do you, do you want to work on that? And I said, well, that sounds interesting. You know, I was doing a minor in nutrition, and I said, I can see how this uh, can kind of intertwine into my degree and it still involves milk. I'm, 
I'm a big milk drinker, of course, coming from a dairy farm. And I said, this sounds really neat. And so uh, that's how it started. So what it is I'm studying specifically is called free fatty acids in milk. And so all milk is made up of milk fat and every milk, like all milk has what's called milk fat globules. And every milk fat globule has a membrane and inside are these components called triacylglycerol molecules. Basically, free fatty acids are caused by any stress or agitation to the milk and it breaks up these milk fat globules. And what are released are the fatty acids and they're then referred to as free. Now, all milk contains some level of free fatty acids, but they should be at uh, very minimal levels. And above a certain threshold, we see milk quality issues, and the one being milk won't foam. So certain coffee shops, you know, they can't get a frothy latte. And I don't know about- Those are first US, world problems Canada, right there. Yeah, in Canada, a lot of people pay, um, they'll pay a lot of money for their Starbucks or whatever latte to get that optimal milk foam, you know? And so it was a concern for them. But then we also, through more testing, found that high levels of free fatty acids in the milk caused cheese coagulation concerns, milk tasting rancid, uh, reduced shelf life. So a lot of uh, quality issues. And um, in all, all um, areas of the world, but especially in Canada, we're a supply managed dairy industry. And so we really rely on consumer satisfaction of dairy products to drive our milk markets. And that can be said for other non-supply managed dairy industries as well. Uh, but we wanted to look at this and see, okay, we started doing testing of free fatty acids on every Ontario dairy farm uh, starting in 2018 to figure, okay, so what are the levels of free fatty acids on the farms? And uh, we knew the certain threshold. So anything above what's called 1.2 millimole per 100 grams of fat, that's kind of our threshold. Anything above that is concerning. Anything below is considered normal. So we found that farms that had high levels of free fatty acids, uh, there were some that, that did and some that didn't and some that were changing a lot. And so we were trying to figure out what what led to my project was, okay, so why do some farms have high levels and why are some farms normal? And so my project's trying to figure out what are the farm factors that are affecting levels of free fatty acids in milk and how can we mitigate them? How can we kind of solve some of those problems so that we can improve milk quality in, in that shape or form? So that's my major project. Uh, that was as part of my, the, uh, as my as part of my PhD, I have six chapters of my thesis, and one of my project was going to visit farms across Canada, uh, specifically in the provinces of Ontario and British Columbia, where they currently test free fatty acids in milk. I went to these farms. I went to 300 farms, asked them a whole bunch of questions. I was measuring pipelines. I was looking at milk flow and trying to again tie some of those factors to what their milk sample free fatty acid level. Uh, was. And so that was my major project in my thesis, but also looking at individual cow factors, feed factors, uh, the bulk tank factors, uh, seasonality factors. So uh, what we know is that basically free fatty acids are multifactorial. There's a lot of different players in it, and it's trying to figure out what are the major contributors so that we can help dairy farmers to uh, improve that milk quality before it even gets to the processing side of things. So that's a little bit of, about what that's, I'm studying. That's really, it's really cool because as a dairy farmer, like we don't even test, I mean, in New York state, we don't even test for free fatty acids at this point in time, but it mm -hmm. is amazing that that's something that's, I am starting to hear it a little bit more. So I'm guessing it's probably coming down the pipeline for us as well. Um, but it is funny how just something like that would affect, you know, the foam on the top of your coffee or something like that, which, I mean, I guess I'm happy if Canadians are worried about the foam, the milk foam on the top of their coffee, that means they're using real milk. So I oh, guess yeah. that that's a, uh, that's an A plus uh, for Canadian coffee drinkers yeah. because real milk is definitely obviously the way to go. Um, but it is funny how something so scientific can affect just something so it seems so simple as frothy milk on the top of your yeah. coffee so <laughs> yeah but, people call me the the coffee or the starbucks researcher <laughs> like that's now, kind of my, my name <laughs> are you an avid drinker of that frothy milk coffee <laughs> i do if i drink i usually have one cup of coffee a day i do like tea and if i'm drinking 
tea or coffee, I put a lot of milk in it. Sometimes Excellent. I froth it. Sometimes I, I don't. It depends on, I guess, my time. <laughs> um, but I usually make it myself. But I've had a lot of fun, you know, when I was starting this project. Um, it was actually at the beginning of COVID was when most of my masters occurred. And I went to my own dairy farm and I was like, I'm going to do my little own research project, you know, as I'm starting to figure out free fatty acids. And so what I did was we were doing uh, milk testing on our on our cows. We have a very small farm. It's about 50 dairy cows in, in a Thai stall facility. And we were doing um, what's called uh, DHI testing um, mm -hmm. with LactNet. And we were taking individual cow samples. And I took some of those leftover milk samples from the cows and I was foaming it in my frother. And I was just trying to see what cows, you know, have the best frothy milk and, and um, our farm doesn't have a free fatty acid issue. So most of them were pretty good, but I got the odd one. I'm like, oh, it doesn't foam, you know, there's something really interesting here. And then I look up on uh, dairy comp, what their lactation stage was, or just trying to get really interested in it. But yeah, it's definitely, I've heard lots of stories from uh, coffee shops if I do go out and enjoy a cup of uh, like a latte or something like that they're like yeah you know milk not frothing it's a big concern when when consumers want froth you know if you have a shipment of milk that doesn't foam they're on the call on the phone right away with their supply and it's like you got to get milk to us right now and so it's it's a big concern for those who are really wanting those frothy lattes so and when you're getting paid enough money for it I guess you got to get what you Get yeah. what you get paid for, definitely. Um, but that is funny. So we're gonna just know you as the milk, the milk frothing girl from now on, right? Exactly. Yeah, I That's think okay. every Christmas I get a new frothing gadget. You know, it's Ooh. either a handheld or like a heating up one, and then I, I got like an espresso machine so I can get a little bit fancy with my coffees. I usually make them myself because I enjoy the art of you know, trying of making it and stuff. But uh, yeah, I have fun with it too. And they'll never need to like try to figure out what Hannah needs for Christmas. Just get her a milk frother of some type. If it Anything looks real weird, cows? even better. Yeah. Yeah. Anything with cows and milk. My friends know me as the, the dairy queen. They call me too. So yeah. Yes. I've, I've been referred to as that as well. So I completely, yeah. I am on the same page as you are. Uh, so you mentioned growing up on a dairy farm. I don't know if you want to talk about growing up um, yeah. a little bit about your family's dairy farm and, you know, what your, you know, how things are at your farm. Yeah. So I am the oldest of four girls. Uh, so my parents met, as I said, my mom's a vet, my dad's a farmer. It's a typical story where the vet comes to check on a cow and, uh, and, and it was and love she, at first sight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, my mom was actually a graduate of the Ontario Veterinary College at Guelph. So there was a little bit of bias, I guess, there when I came to, to Guelph as well. Um, but yeah, so I, I have three younger siblings. So I'm the oldest. Uh, my youngest sibling is 10 years younger than me. So there is quite a quite a spread. But you know what, now that we're, I say grown up, you know, we, we all get along really well. And I feel very close to all my, all my siblings. But uh, yeah, growing up, I was very fortunate, you know, having that lifestyle on a farm. My parents were very um, helpful in, in getting us involved, whether it's through lots of sports or community engagement, we were big um, involved in, in 4-H quite a lot as well. Um, and uh, in other agricultural societies. And so my parents were always on milk committees. My mom is currently on the board of directors for Gailey Foods, which is a milk company in, in Canada. And so I, I was very fortunate to have that upbringing. I was always very fascinated by farm. I loved going to the farm. Dairy is our main operation. As I said, we have about 50 cows who milk in a Thai stall. Uh, but I think part of the the cause of my mom being a vet is we have a lot of other animals as well. So we have some sheep, we have chickens, we sometimes have a couple of, of pigs as well. Um, we have dogs, we have lots of cats, you know, barn cats. Uh, and recently I started uh, beekeeping, uh, actually. So Ooh. I took that up 
uh, during the pandemic too. So that's kind of my gig, uh, my little side uh, business. And I, and I really do enjoy bees. They're very different than any other agricultural animal. They, so. they are definitely fascinating. I've always yeah. been very intrigued by them. Um, yeah. I have not added it to the list of many things that I have going on because I don't need anything else lot. to worry about, but, um, yep. they've always fascinated me and I do, um, those honey sticks that you can get sometimes, especially at like a bee specific store and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. So that's my little, nobody else touches the bees, you know, but I, I enjoy their honey. I enjoy working with them. It allows me, I'm not at home currently, obviously I'm at the university of Guelph, which is, it's about two hour drive from home. Uh, but I still go home at least every other weekend just to see my family and be with my, be with, be with my cows, be with my bees. And so I was that just going to say, be with my bees. Got to yeah. go home and be with the bees. I usually, yeah. I usually go home and say, oh, I need to go tend to my bees. So uh, yeah, but they're, they're, they're very self-sufficient creatures. So I don't need to be there, you know, for morning and night chores, et cetera. Yes. But <laughs> a little so, yeah, less was... hands off than cows. So that's a good thing. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I, I grew up, I went to high school was still, you know, I would come home, I usually have a few chores that I would that I would help with on the farm. Um, and then when I got into high school, I got very much into long distance running. And so that was kind of my passion. I remember asking my dad to time me if I wanted to go and see how fast it took me to get up the hill to like bring the cows down from uh, <laughs> for, to, in for milking. Um, and actually one of, I remember people asked me, how did I get into long distance running? And I'll never forget this story of, you know, I used to always be very involved in athletics, but uh, lots of different sports. And why did I choose running? Well, there was one particular race I did in grade eight and my parents were always on the milk committee. And uh, as part of the milk committee at this race, they would give all the finishers chocolate milk when they finished. Well, being in grade eight, my, my race was one of the last because they kind of go from youngest to oldest and they were running out of chocolate milk. So oh, before no. the race, yeah, before the race, they told me, you know, we only have enough chocolate milk to give to the top 10 finishers. And they said, if you want a chocolate milk, you better like run fast. And so I like chocolate milk is one of my favorite things. And Did I was for just the chocolate tired milk. Up. Exactly. I think previous races I've come like, 50th or 60th you know I've just been like I'm gonna get that chocolate milk anyway uh, but I do have a bit of a competitive nature inside of me and so when they said there's only 10 left I just I booked it and I finished fourth oh there I you go my, I got my chocolate milk and my parents I remember they were absolutely in disbelief and they're like wow you know you got you got some wheels in you <laughs> and so um, that started and I my, I had a grade eight teacher that took me under his wing and he helped me get into running a bit more. And then I actually joined a club uh, when I went to high school and then landed in an athletic scholarship at the University of Guelph, too. So that's kind of how it started. I said, it's all because of that that chocolate milk, you know, and that's still my number one uh, recovery drink of, of choice, you know, 100%. and then gives me chocolate milk. I am happy. <laughs> Yes, I feel that. So what's your distance of choice? Yeah, so I'm a distance runner. Um, so again, people think I'm crazy for that one that I run and two that I like to run far. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd say mainly 10K is probably my main distance. I really love cross country running, which involves, yep. you know, going through forests or going up hills, uh, the terrain, the unpredictability of it. Uh, that's my that's my main event, and I've been fortunate to be on a couple of national teams with it. Um, Very cool. I really wish it was an Olympic sport because that would be the one I've been driving for. But it's either you do 10k on the track, which is equivalent to 25 laps, which is that's, really oh god boring. What I want to do, <laughs> or you go up to the marathon, you know. And I think eventually I'd like to get into marathon training, but. Right now, I just don't have the time with school and everything. You have to really put in a lot of work oh, yeah. for that. So I'd say kind of a sweet spot is, is 10K. I've done quite a few road races as well. I have done a half marathon, um, and I've done a bunch of 5Ks. And as short of, I say my shortest distance that I'll do is a 1,500 meter. So yep. a range, but yeah, my favorite is definitely the distance. Well, that's good. If you go back a couple episodes, I interviewed Emma and Kelsey 
Uh, Kelsey is a marathon runner and Emma does Ironman triathlons. So oh, awesome. I okay. do have some good friends that do long distances. I am a short distance person. Um, 5k is about as long as I go yeah. or did go. I don't even think I could do one now, but uh, I'm definitely a short distance gal. So that's okay. Uh, you know what, for people just getting out there, there's just something about for me, especially when I'm not on my farm, like getting outside, just feeling kind of in nature and kind of having that headspace to think. I think it definitely. it really helps my studies. You know, if, if I have kind of a, a brain block, I can go for a little run and I come back. I'm like, okay, I can yes, continue refresh. writing. <laughs> no, I definitely get that. Um, so yeah, that's fascinating. And I hope one day I get to cheer for you <laughs> running the marathon somewhere. So that would be yeah. fun. Um. So what other sports like were you into as a kid? You said you were very into different sports. Yeah, I think name everything. So I was into swimming. I did figure skating. I did gymnastics. I did hockey. I did basketball. Now I was, I didn't grow until like high school. And so I remember being on the basketball team and they put me into on defense because I could jump high and here I am not even five feet and I'm being towered by these <laughs> giant girls but I you know I tried to st- stick up for myself and my team but uh yeah lots of I did um part of a part of a rifle club so oh, and fun. I did cross-country skiing um yeah lots of lots of different sports our schedule was always so packed it was like every night we had some sort of activity that we were doing after school and extracurricular and I and I really value that my my parents gave me lots of options and and let us choose you know by by the time it came to high school it was like okay got to narrow it down because obviously school is getting a bit more serious and also just just time <laughs> and definitely uh, and if we wanted to specialize in something you know we couldn't do it all yeah. I'm still uh I really think that it's important for younger generations to not specialize too soon you know like you really want to enjoy figure out what sports there are and and make it playful like I think that's uh, that keeps kids especially in in sports for a long time and so when it came to high school you know I as I said I got really into distance running um, my second sport that I still really enjoyed doing was gymnastics and so I went to uh, provincials in gymnastics in grade nine um, at the same time as I was still running competitively and I and I was in provincials for running and I found that that was kind of the tipping point where I couldn't go that much further in gymnastics without hindering some of my running capabilities yep. and the stunts were getting a little bit more challenging and uh, it was getting a bit scary and so I decided to then fully go into running Um, but I still do, I think to this day, um, I still do a lot of different sports, you know, running is very hard on your body. So you need to be able to change it up. So I do a lot of biking and I still do a lot of swimming. I actually have been a lifeguard for a number of years. I still lifeguard. That's kind of my little part-time job. I also teach aquafit. So that's kind of a little part-time job on side of, of doing school as well. People ask me, Oh, why don't you do a triathlon then? And I said, someday I will, you know. I like doing all the sports individually, but I don't really like always, like, I don't see myself tying it all together in one consecutive go, but you know, I got to do it someday. So, so we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Uh, We'll be looking out to see what you decide to do and where you go (laughs) with it on top of obviously where you're, where you're going to end up in the world with your uh, future career. So you mentioned there's what, four of you daughters. Yeah. Yeah, and my dad is very outnumbered, you know, between I, the cows and the sheep and the chickens and his girls, like the, the pony and the bull are his friends. We'll there say. you go. <laughs> the, the couple guys have to stick together around the farm. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So do any of your sisters have plans of actually returning to the dairy or what's the future plans yeah. for the dairy? Yeah, so the farm is very close, near and dear to my heart. Um, And I have probably my youngest sister is right now. She's still at home. She's in uh, grade 11. So she's 16 years old. 
Um, she's very involved in the farm. You know, she loves genetics. She loves being with the cows and helping out on the farm, uh, which is really great. And like, she's very invested. And uh, currently we're looking at kind of that succession planning of turning over the farm. Um, we're still trying to figure things out because obviously she's only 16. Yeah. Uh, there's still like a number of years she wants to go to college or, or university and get a degree first. And I think that's important to get off the farm to realize how much you really want it. Like that's what it took for me to get off the farm and realize how important everything agriculture and the dairy industry is for me to return yeah. back to that school. Um, so we're in the we're currently in the stage of looking at um, like renovating my, our barn or, or succession planning in terms of we might go robotic. That's what we're looking okay. at the next stage from tie stall to, to robots, uh, just because obviously a tie stall is, is quite hard on, on the body, yes. you know. Um, and we're kind of at that stage of it's like, well, you know, in the future, this is what kind of the dairy technology is is looking at. So we've had a lot of conversations. As I said, I think my youngest sister is probably the most invested in it. But that's not to say that I there is an option that I could also come home and, and help out. Um, kind of, I would like to use my degree, that's for sure. Like, you know, I've yeah. done all this schooling, I would love to use my degree. But there's lots of producers I've met that are able to have both, you know, be able yeah. to sustain dairy farming on a small scale, but be able to also um, use their degree in, in other aspects of the industry. So trying to figure it out, um, even if it means, you know, I go home and I help out for a couple of years until my sister's ready to take that next stage. Um, yep. That's kind of what we're planning. The, the middle two, um, my other two siblings, one is in the Cayman Islands and she's oh. a music teacher. So <laughs> that's a big change from dairy farming yes. in Canada. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She's always like... She has loved the farm, but I I think growing up it was never really quite in her in her thing uh, to to live on the farm or be involved with yeah. the cows as much. Um, so she's yeah living the dream. You know, she sends me pictures of her scuba diving or in the tropics, and here I am in Canada. You know, and I'm like bundled up with three feet of snow. Yes, yeah, <laughs> like oh, sucks yeah. to be you. I know. I I want to definitely. I want to go visit her after I'm done my degree as a little present of graduation to me. So oh, definitely. And, yeah, and then my next sister, um, she's actually at University of Guelph too. So she's oh. studying what's called One Health. It's kind of that idea that human health, animal health, and environmental health are all intertwined. Um, she does, you know, play a huge role in our farm, especially when she's home. You know, when we're all home. We always go and help out. It's kind of just helping our, our parents out. And she is invested, but I think she's more looking into going into vet school. Okay. Um, so yes. we'll see. You know, when I was that young, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I still don't know exactly what I want to do at this age. So there's definitely, like, as I said, the farm is very close to me and I wouldn't let it go, especially being a supply managed dairy industry. You know, we have that quota um, unfortunately when it's gone, it's, it's, it's gone. So I think it's, yeah. it's very important for me to keep it in the, in the family. And as I said, it's my, it's my childhood and my parents are always going to live on that farm. And so I think they, they would like to see it get, uh, get passed down too. Definitely. And I know that that's very important. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the Canadian quota system for those that maybe don't know yeah. too much about it? Yeah, so as I said, supply management, uh, also another word is, is, is quota. And so basically, um, you have to have a dairy farm has to have quota, which is the rights to sell milk. And so certain um, farms are allotted certain amount of quota, and that's as much milk as you can produce and ship. Um, it goes to in our province, it goes to dairy farmers of Ontario we will pick up our milk and they pay us based on it. So this this management, um, this industry, it allows for equal payments uh, to dairy producers. And so they get um, and they get very it's very stable. And so it helps those smaller farms to still um, survive. So it's not that, you know, the bigger, the better it's it's very constant and uh, and it allows those small, small farms, family operated farms to stay in the dairy industry. And we're very big on an industry on milk quality. And so that allows, you know, it's not just bigger or better. It's, it's, it's really, we want to hone down on producing the highest quality milk possible. We have a lot of quality standards um, in check. And so, as I said, like quota, you have to have quota, whether you 
it gets passed down through the family or on the market. There's um, there's quotas sometimes for sale or if a farm is selling, they'll sell the quota with it. And so you have to have quota to be able to sell milk and, uh, and, and dairy farms. So that's kind of how the dairy industry works. But as I said, it's a it works. It's a very good system, in my opinion. As I said, equal payments, um, stable market, and uh, yeah, equal pricing. And so it, it just uh, it's it's different. Like Canada, definitely. I, I think one of the only ones still in there. And how it works is also it keeps things local. So we we don't import a lot from the United States. You know, yep. most of the milk is staying local. It's in Canada, um, but that means we also don't export a ton either so it's yeah. kind of just keeping our market pretty uh pretty closed and uh yeah that's kind of how it works very cool so the only way to if you did want to grow the only way would be to basically purchase more if it was for sale which I'm sure comes yeah. at a very pretty penny yes I can't tell you the exact price because it's always changing but oh it yeah is expensive um <laughs> Yeah. And so we're always, uh, even our farm today, you know, usually every month we, we buy a little bit more quota just so we okay. can keep growing a little bit. And that's what most farmers will do. As I said, there's some farms that will decide to uh, put everything, you know, they don't maybe can't pass it down to the next, the next generation. So they decide to put everything um, on the market and then you can buy little pieces of it at a, at a reasonable rate, but it's like very small increments. You just, yeah, kind of uh, Pip away at, at a very short uh, scale. And uh, yeah. So do you, is the quota based upon cow numbers themselves or milk weight or how does that? It's kilograms of butter fat is what I, okay. what I believe. Yeah. So it's a, how much, uh, yeah, kilograms, milk, butter fat, like that's what we're mostly paid on, on a uh, fat percentage. Yep. Um, so our, our components weigh quite a lot with fat being being the highest and so that's okay. kind of how we how the producers are are paid so if you were to go over your quota what happens or they just don't pick yeah it up, or so how does happens, that work yeah so from my understanding again I'm not the dairy farmer on my farm but like yeah, I definitely thought about the quota system um, but you have this kind of window where you have to produce a certain amount, but you can't go over for okay. most times of the years. Now, there are certain times of the years called incentive days, and that's where there's a boost in production. So you're allowed to per to produce a little bit over your quota allotment. Um, okay. And that's usually happens in the fall in preparation of making butter stocks, you know, holidays to, like things for the holidays yeah yep. so there's more higher demand for that butter fat uh, from the industry so we're allowed to produce a little bit more and so throughout the year there will be release of you know incentive days and you can fill those incentive days and by the end of the year if you haven't you know filled those incentive days you can fill them then and so okay. it just allows a little bit of um, flexibility but in general, you know, as I said, it's a stable market. Like it's, you know, we milk 50 cows and, you know, next month we can't just all automatically milk 10 more cows, you know, we're yeah. going to have way too much milk. And so, as I said, it's pretty constant, but if we have an incentive days, either producers can change their feed ration to get a little bit more milk out of the cows or they can dry yeah. off. Maybe they're going to, if we need to reduce our milk shipments, we can dry off a few more cows. So there's way to, ways to manage the herd without buying more cows yep. or selling more cows and having that uh, really high changes or dynamic part of it. Very the, cool. It yeah. is fascinating just from someone who obviously we have a fairly free market in the United States to someone who has the quota system. And, you know, you guys don't do a lot of exports, but U.S., we are very big into exporting dairy and doing that kind of thing. So it's, it's really neat to get a, the perspective of the differences. And we're, I mean, we're not that far apart mm -hmm. geographically. So it is funny to yeah. just see those differences. Um, so I guess I want to kind of backtrack to your research. And I know that you said you've recently been published a few places. So I don't yeah. know if you want to give a shout out to where people can find your publications. Yeah, so I've been fortunate to be interviewed for a lot of um, 
little things of my research, I was, well, actually, we met at the World Dairy Summit in Chicago about, I think it was about a month ago. Yep, just a little and, over a month ago. Yeah, yeah. And so I was presenting my research there. I had a poster presentation. Um, and I actually won the won the poster competition. Oh, so that congratulations. Kind of of I don't know if I even realized that. So congratulations. <laughs> That's okay. That's Jeez. okay. Yeah, it was my first time being at the World Dairy Summit. And uh, they were looking for more Canadian representatives, especially yep. students to sponsor to go. Um, and I was also asked to be on the young farmers panel, which yep. is where which is where me met. But yeah, I took my poster there. And uh, there were I think there were over 80 countries represented. That's awesome. Oh, sorry, over 20 countries, 80 posters. Yep. One way or the other. Yeah. But there were lots of lots of posters, lots of countries represented, um, seven categories. And I was super honored to have mine uh, that was chosen to win. And so that generated quite a lot of news. And I had a lot of people reach out wanting to share my story, get to know a little bit more about my research. So basically awesome. online. If you search my name, Hannah Woodhouse Dairy, there's a lot of articles that come up. I have published one um, that's in uh, Journal of Dairy Science. It's a communications piece. It, it talks a little bit about some of the major factors that we've been doing through the research that suggest that could be associated with higher levels of free fatty acids. You're also welcome to, um, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram. Uh, Facebook, all these, all the social media pieces. So very um, cool. Yeah, there's lots of ways to find me and, and find some of the research uh, work that I'm doing as well. Awesome. Um, so I guess we're at the point where I like to ask just a couple fun questions just to kind of get to know you a little bit better. Uh, yeah. So your go-to comfort food. Ooh. Besides chocolate milk, because we've already established yeah. that chocolate milk is life. Yeah, I love homemade mac and cheese. My Ooh. mom makes a great mac and cheese. You know, it's creamy on like a cold day. You can, yeah, make it with, we make it with our whole milk and lots of cheese, noodles. Um, so being a runner, I eat a lot of carbs and a lot of dairy too. So I'd say that's a, that's one of my, one of my favorite foods. Your go-to's. Sure. Yeah, that's that's a pretty solid go to. I would and it's I would not tend like, yeah, and not the craft like, you know, craft is OK at times when you're in a pinch, but homemade mac and cheese hits different. That's for sure. It does. And yeah. I mean, we get both. Well, which we have um, my co-op. Actually, we have a like a boxed mac and cheese now too. um Cabot mac and cheese. If you haven't tried it, it's delicious. Okay. Um, okay. But so, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't get the time to make homemade mac and cheese, which we cater a lot with our catering business. So we do make a lot of homemade mac and cheese for that. Okay. But um, of course, my kids are like, oh, I want the boxed stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> I mean, I can I can tolerate it. It's still mac yeah. and cheese, so it's still delicious. Yeah, yeah, we yeah that being it. said, I'm not I'm not a picky eater at all. So if somebody makes me something, I will, as a runner, I'm always hungry. I'm like great food I'll take it <laughs> sure why not <laughs> oh my goodness um so how about if you could go on a dream vacation somewhere where are you going oh I think one of the places I would love to visit is New Zealand New I Zealand. would really love to go see there I, like Australia and New Zealand are two of my top places but from what I've heard they're very similar except for New Zealand doesn't have all the animals that can kill you is what I've been told <laughs> so. yes that's that's yes I'm so intrigued by Australia but I'm like oh but there's like those I, snakes and I things snakes. so I do I and snakes so I think yeah. that's one of the major things um but yeah I'm not you know, I like, I like going to warm tropical locations, but I'm always on the go. Like I love doing stuff. And so I'd love to go somewhere where I can actually do and see things, you know, it's nice to sit at the beach for a day or two, but I, that my sort of yep. vacation isn't sitting there for, for a whole week. So I think New Zealand would be really fascinating to see the dairy industry. You know, from what I've heard, it's, it's totally different. Like farmers almost mm -hmm. get a vacation during the I think the non-growing season is what I've heard. It's, oh, that sounds really nice. So yeah. <laughs> Vacation? Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I can, yeah, I can exactly. definitely see where that would be pretty fun. So that's a fun, fun, interesting. And I'm the same way as far as vacationing. I can sit still for maybe a day or two and then I'm like, okay, we have to do something. And sometimes I think that's all dairy farmers, honestly. <laughs> well, my husband Greg is just like, you know, we can go on vacation and we don't have to schedule every single minute of it. I'm like, but we do. We're only on vacation for so long and I want to do this and I want to do this and this. And he's yeah. just like, or we can just relax. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Like, we can't yeah. do that. <laughs> I'm relaxed when I'm on the go. That's how yeah, it works. Exactly. Um, all right. Let's see. And sorry, I'm just perusing my questions so I can find a good one. That's okay. Um, let's see. Your so are you you're from Canada, you kind of get four seasons, even though winter I think probably takes the majority of the year yeah we like, see snow starting in October and oh gosh. it's sometimes not gone until April <laughs> April oh like late April so yeah yeah but our summers are beautiful um, where I'm from we get kind of we have kind of the four uh four seasons definitely like winter definitely takes over we're right on the, we get the lake effect so we get a lot oh. of snow up there um, but there's always something to do. You know, we, we live right beside, it's called the Blue Mountains. So there's lots of people skiing. I love cross-country skiing around our farm. In the summer, people are always on the lake. Um, lots of boating, lots of fishing, kayaking, canoeing down the river. And then in the fall, we get beautiful fall colors. Yep. Um, and in the spring, people are always biking um, around our country roads. And so we have a lot of tourists. We attract a lot of people to our area. And it is a very beautiful place to live. I'm very grateful to call that my home. Well, that's good. If I get to Canada, I'll have to come visit. Oh, I, yes, for sure. Then, oh, gosh, it's been I need to. Well, first, I need to update my passport because you know, <laughs> kind of can't go visit without that. But yes. um, yeah, I haven't been. I went to Canada. Ooh, it was probably 20 some odd years ago. Okay. So yeah. So I need to get back up to Canada. Yes. Yes. Don't come at the height of winter. Like I nope. think our fall, yeah, our fall and our, our summers are beautiful. Like we actually get very hot summers. Sometimes we get those okay. extreme temperatures. Like we can see, I'm sorry, I'm going to say Celsius, but up to yeah. 30, 32 degrees Celsius in the summer, uh, which is quite hot yet yep. humid um beautiful sunshine in the summer and then in the winter it can get to minus 20 you know um degrees celsius again yeah. i'm sorry no, i don't you. know that conversion but basically <laughs> cold. cold and a lot of snow real um, cold real hot that's the yes. scientific terms yes. that we need for today yes yes and that's why i love the spring and fall you know a little bit in between <laughs> yes we i definitely would not be visiting in the winter because where i am in new york it is cold enough for me. I don't need to get colder. So we're yes. going to a more of a fair weather. Yes. Fair weather curl. I don't particularly care for the cold. So exactly. Especially when I'm trying to do running training. As soon as I see snow, I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. Again. And it now it's time to freeze. But it's not as fun to run in the cold, snowy. Yeah. But I nope. would prefer that over a treadmill. I will, I hate treadmills, so I will always get outside. And even if I'm dressed in, you know, winter boots or whatever, oh my gosh. Do winter boot workouts and yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's another different atmosphere to, you know, as I said, it, it builds definitely toughness to run through the winter. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to let you take care of that for me. Yes. <laughs> um, so you can run an extra mile for me and call it good. Um, and I guess last question. So uh, do you guys, do you guys have the, you have a lottery in Canada, right? Like a. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you know, double yep. check before I asked you and you're like, oh, we don't have that. So, yeah. okay. So you win the lottery. What's your first purchase? Oh, I, uh, I have to think on that. You know, I think it would be very cool to own. Well, like housing is ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> I do. Fortunately, I own a house, uh, purchased it before the market spikes. So I'm thankful I have a home, but I think it would be very cool to purchase another home, you know, somewhere. Vacation warmer. home. Yeah. Maybe like, like I don't see myself being a full snowboard, but it would be cool to have a different home and like, I love to also purchase my own 
will farm. <laughs> I think yeah. that would definitely be in the cards. I see myself, whatever job I end up working, I definitely want to live in the country, in the rural area, have my own barn. You know, I could purchase maybe a robot for my parents too. And put one in for- At least you're generous <laughs> in thinking of how you're spending your millions, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think nowadays it doesn't take uh, much yeah, a million dollars doesn't go very far for a no. farm to say. <laughs> yeah, A million dollars doesn't go far anywhere anymore, no. unfortunately, which is crazy to think because it's such a huge number, but unfortunately it would go very yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, dairy farmers, we could especially spend it. Oh, yes, really for quick. sure. So For sure. Definitely. All right, uh, Hannah, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I uh, had a lot of fun learning about the different things and you know what those little things that affect your frothy milk uh, on top of your coffee and all that fun stuff um we wish you the best of luck in your uh presenting your your uh, research and all that good stuff and obviously getting your dream job whatever that may be to be determined right yes Uh, exactly And I will link in the show notes where to find you if people want to follow along on your journey or look up your research. And again, I just want to remind everyone, check out this app. It is free and it is easy to find. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to be notified of future episodes and leave a review. You can find me on most social media platforms at Dairy Gal Val or online at DairyGalVal.com. Thank you so much for coming to the Dairy Hour.